Welcome to the first Laura C. Harris event of the second semester, and hooray for every one of you who made it out in the snow. I'm really proud of you for thinking, yeah, 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 that's probably still going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks for coming. So Rachel came all the way from um, Woodstock, New York. Does that name mean anything to anybody here? Hence the astrology and I the know, hippie trip. I know, I know. All right, so um, she's a solutionary artist, performer, community activator, facilitator, and storyteller. You could probably tell all of these things already, yeah? Um, and she's um, part of multiple environmental, social, spiritual justice, social justice movement kinds of activism. She's a co-founder of Earth Guardians of New York. She's a, an advisor for uh, Center for Earth Ethics, and ha I happen to notice that the highest um, disciplines here are women's and gender studies and environmental science so environmental studies so so that makes sense given who rachel is um and then she does a lot of training for young leaders wherever she travels and she works with groups like this all the time so we're really psyched to have her here warm welcome for rachel Okay, and then we're also really, really fortunate to have three local activists who work in different ways here. I'm going to introduce each of the three of them because when Rachel goes back to New York, we'll still have lots of people that you can tie into to continue working here. Uh, the two big issues that you named were um, on-campus issues and national issues, interestingly enough, and we have ways to get you connected into both of those once this workshop is over, so hooray for that. So let me start with Carol Apaki. Carol, do you wanna maybe stand up or wave or something, or maybe go out into the middle and do a little dance? <laughs> I, I think that means no. Do you think that laugh meant no? I'm not sure. Okay, so Carol was in the Peace Corps, for any of you who are thinking about doing that. I'm, yeah, okay, so starting, she served in Thailand, and she's also been actively involved in this community, in the Granville community, as a volunteer for a long time, most of her adult life. Um, when she sees a need, she then figures out how to respond to that, so she's one of those people who um, makes up ways to be active. When there's a need, she kind of starts talking to other people and gathering ideas and figures out what to do, right? So that's a really huge skill, as we were finding out in my Fem theory class this year. That's hard to do. Carol's an expert at that. So if you're interested in doing that, she's a good person to connect with. And she's personally responsible for, I mean, with a group, but for things like the cooperative nursery school here in town, like all kinds of things that you may or may not have on your activist agenda, but as you move through your life and you have certain needs and they need to be met, um, you'll figure out which things are the most important to you then. She's also most recently part of the League of Women Voters of Licking County, and we're going to get to that. We'll start with Rita Kip right here. And I can tell you, we're also involved in Licking County Concerned Citizens, which is a tracking concerns about tracking and social media digital data sharing and Great, thanks, Carol. Thanks for that. Um, Rita Kipp is here. She lives in the Granville community, but she taught at Kenyon College. Where? <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry. That was my inside voice speaking. She was at Kenyon College in cultural anthropology for 28 years, and um, then she started taking various kinds of administrative positions, and her academic life includes teaching in gender studies and publishing articles about women's experiences while also advocating for equal opportunity and sexual harassment training in the academy. And in particular, she has been working on um, Indivisible, which is gathering petitions, right, the petition signatures, yeah. Um, for a ballot initiative and also this gerrymandering and it may be that we're going to need to explain something about gerrymandering after this workshop is over to help people understand what that is a little more. And she chairs the brand new chapter, um, I, I think it's really kind of a renewed chapter, right? Okay, yeah, a renewed chapter of the League of Women Voters here in Licking County. So Rita Kipp. And the, and the, <laughs> 
And the third person is Cecile Shaw, and she's been connected to Denison for a number of years through um, her spouse, whom you may know. He's on the faculty here, Jack Schuler, just in case you don't connect those names. And Cecile is the person who started a fairly new group called Strong Voices Rising, which was in response to the political elections a little over a year ago. And that sense of a need, like, I need to do something. I need to channel this frustration or energy in some way or another. And, Cecile put out a Facebook, if I'm remembering right, is that right? Put out a Facebook charge and a lot of people started signing on and people started finding each other in conversation and that started a huge, huge movement of people gathering in all kinds of ways. She was a, an activist as an undergraduate. She went to Douglas College um, and Rutgers University. Uh, that, Douglas is part of Rutgers, I think, right? Yeah, which was um, an all-women's college and there she developed her beliefs that personal is political while participating in student government and harm reduction. Um, and in particular, let's see, um, the Strong Voices Rising supports various kinds of political activism in our local area right here. And I think, is it true? Are you running for school board? And she's going to be on the Granville School Board. We're just going to say it's a done deal, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Cecile Shaw. So those are our four um, presenters who are going to help organize what's going on today. And they've spent, by the way, the last three days or so organizing, meeting each other and organizing this for you all. So it's been a terrific process of collaboration. So thanks to all of them. So did any, did it, should we all sort of speak, should we speak a little bit or should we move right into um, do you guys want to introduce, should we introduce ourselves or should we just go right into, okay. So I'm going to take back the mic and we are going to do an exercise that has us back up again out of our seats and mingling. So everybody can hop up and I'm just going to warn you right now, you're going to end up sitting back down and you might not know who you're sitting down with now, but you'll find out when you do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize this tiny little space and we are gonna pretend that we are on a busy street in the middle of the day or in the beginning of the morning or setting out for your day and we are gonna mingle. We're gonna fast pace kind of mingle through this tiny little space. Come on out, you guys. We're gonna mingle. We're gonna mingle. We're gonna mingle. Yeah, we're actually doing this. And now, you're gonna mingle as though you're walking down a street and you don't really know who's, who's on it. You're not necessarily looking at them. You're moving kind of fast. You don't necessarily need to talk to each other. You're just mingling. You're just mingling. You're moving. Just mingle. Just mingle. Come on. We're gonna mingle. We're gonna mingle. We're gonna mingle. Going to mingle. You're moving fast. What kind of things are you thinking about on your way to work? What are you worried about? What comes up for you when you're on your way to work? You're not necessarily thinking about the people on the street around you. You don't really know anybody. You might have stuff on your mind. Maybe you're broke. Maybe you have a test. Maybe you're afraid of what might happen when you don't pass the test. Maybe the world is crumbling around you. Maybe you're worried about fracking. You don't necessarily care about the people that you're walking around. You're just walking in a busy street. Okay. Stop. Now, you're going to pair off with the person closest to you. Find a seat where the two of you can sit down. There you go. There you go. Has anybody, is there anyone who doesn't have a person? Raise your hand. There you go. These two. There you go. Does anybody not have a person? Okay. You two can hook up. Is everybody doubled up? Okay. Cool. So now we're going to take two minutes each. And we're going, this, this is interesting. And people don't usually do it. You need chairs? Okay. There's two chair. There's some chairs back here. You can sit on the floor if that doesn't matter. There's a chair right there. So everybody who's got a partner, you're going to actually turn and face your partner so you can move your chairs. You can move your chairs. Right? 
Oh, you guys are on the floor. All right, you can move your chairs. Did you get a partner? So, but we need, we're gonna do two. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. This is your, this is the meeting part. It's really okay, you're gonna be fine. It's really okay, I swear. And, and we could partner up if you want to break it up. Like, I don't have to lead us to this. But. Okay. So you're going to be listening to each other. And you guys, since we're doing four minutes, maybe you can do one minute each. Okay. Can you hand me that phone on the window there? Okay. So this is, this is the question. Here's my question for you all. We're going to say, who has the longest hair is going to go first. Whoever's hair is longer is going to go first. In your group, with your person. Okay? And here's, the, here's, here's what you get. Two minutes. The listener, the person with the shortest hair, is going to just listen. You don't need to give any feedback. No judgment. This is a safe space. Keep the judgment out of the room. There's no need for that. What are we doing here? What brought you here? What is the concern that would bring you into a workshop like this where you're trying to figure out how to take action in your community? What brought you here? What is, what is, the, what is the need? Is it fracking in your community? Is it gender bias? Is it racial tension? Is it the T word in the office whose name I don't say? What is it that brought you here? You have two minutes to tell that person. And that person's just going to hear you. And you're going to tell them why you're here. Go. OK. So how did that feel kind of think of, you don't have to tell anybody, but how did that feel to sort of like take yourself out of the bustle and the hustle and stop in front of somebody you never met, or maybe you did meet and you know and you see every day, and kind of like talk to them in, the, in, a, in a way that you weren't necessarily expecting to do when you got here. Think about that. And then we're gonna mingle again, only this time, you're gonna look the people in, your eye, in the eye as you wander around, and we can get up and we can start to do that mingle. We don't need to talk. We're gonna silently mingle, but we're going to look at the people in the eye as we think about what just happened where we were able to speak to somebody and sort of personalize what matters to us. So look the people in your eye as you walk around in this little, tiny little group, this little room here. And just look at the people and sort of acknowledge this time that there are other people on the path, that it isn't just about what happens when you get to work or you get to school or you get home, but actually there might be people between you and that space. And those people might actually be processing something intense. You never know what's going on for them. And now, you're gonna land, hopefully, in front of someone that you weren't just sitting with, and you're gonna sit down again in a spot. And what's fascinating is that everybody has already been heard. What a cool, weird thing. There's 60 people in the room, and you've all been heard in a matter of four minutes. Okay, so now the person with the lighter colored t-shirt or shirt top is going to speak first. And this time, is everybody paying attention? Snap if you can hear me. Awesome. This time, you're not really talking about what concerns you. The person with the lighter colored t-shirt is gonna start this time with why you wanna make that change. Not the why that's causing the pain, but the why that's at the other end of this result. So, for instance, 
I am working really hard in my community to stop a massive fossil fuel infrastructure build out, right? So when I sat down, I might say, I'm super concerned about the fact that my kid might not have a future because they're, they can light the water on fire not too far away from where I live, right? But now this time, why are you here? I'm, I'm here because I want to see your grandchildren have an opportunity to survive. I'm here because I want to live in a space where the, the trees grow freely and anyone can sit under the shade of that tree and feel awesome. What is the thing that drives you to want to make a change? What is the, what's the beautiful thing at the other end? What is the inspiration that makes you want to make change in your community? The inspired part. Try that. See how that works. Lighter shirt person, tell the darker shirt person you got two minutes. Okay. So we can, if we can pull that in and wrap that up a little bit. And maybe, um, maybe stay kind of in circular motion if we can kind of pull back into a circle. And, um, and we can take the next, the next stage. How did that feel? to kind of switch from what your concern is to the change you want to see. Right, because that old, that sort of what's becoming now the cliche saying of be the change you want to see in the world. Um, thank you. Um, to be that change, we have to kind of know what that change is we're looking for. And so many of us are spend our time kind of um, pushing against systems that we don't even believe we can topple. How about that? What if we actually have a minute where we believe we can make change? And what if we can actually hold on to a vision that, um, that allows us to, to move toward something, to persist toward something? And so, so that's why I called us into that kind of circle, that, that wild, weird little space, so that we could, um, you know, so we can kind of get a little bit of what might be on our shoulders off and, um, and move toward like a positive what's next. And, um, and so we had talked about doing like just sort of going around in the circle and introducing ourselves with like one name, our gender pronoun of preference and, maybe one word that would sort of, you know, express why we're here. Quick, does anybody want to do that? Or does that seem, seems kind of like a nice way now that we've sort of met each other, right? Should I go for, I'll go first and we'll go left. No? Yeah. <laughs> My, she, she, they're uncomfortable, so why did you make her really uncomfortable? My name is Rachel and my, I'm a, I'm a girl, I'm a she, and I feel inspired. My name is Jasmine, uh, pronouns are she, her, hers, and I feel empowered. My name is Vanessa, uh, I go by she, her, hers, and I'm here fighting for equity, not equality. I'm, sorry, I'm Leah. Uh, I am going by female pronouns, and I like environmental stability. I'm Justine. Um, she, her, hers. Um, I think I'm here because I'm frustrated. Michael, they, them, livability for more life. I'm Hui. Um, she, her, hers, and sustainability. I'm M, I go by she, her, or they, them, and here because I'm driven. Um, I'm Simone Talese, and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I don't really know why I'm here, but I guess we'll find out. Uh, my name is Lamine, um, my pronouns are he, his, um, peace, I'm here for peace.
Crystal, um, her, her, hers, I, I don't know if I just said that once, but um, school reform. I'm Jessica, uh, she, her, hers, and I'm here for equity. I'm Lily, uh, she, hers, her, hers, and I'm here because I'm curious. I'm Mia, my pronouns are they, them, there, and I'm here because I'm tired. I'm Kayla, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm here because I want to take up space. I'm Maddie, she, her, hers, I'm here because I'm hopeful. I'm Fatale, she, her, hers, and I'm here for the voices that go unheard. I'm Pearl, female pronouns, and I'm here for livable lives, not just living. Hi, I'm Maddie, I go by they, them, she, her, and I'm here because I believe in love. I'm Cecile, she, and I'm also curious. I'm Jordan, she, her, hers, um, and I'm here because I've been feeling a little discouraged. I'm Sarah, she, her, hers, and I am seeking empowerment. Hi, I'm Lisa, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I'm passionate. Hi, I'm Drayton, or Dre, and I'm here. I really don't really know why I'm here. I'm just comfortably lost. Hi, I'm Hannah. I go by she, her, hers. Whoa. Um, and I'm here because I'm nervous but hopeful. Hi, I'm Bronwyn, she, her, hers, and I think I'm here because I want to stop kicking up so much things. Hi, I'm Mackenzie, uh, she, her, hers, and I'm here for reflection and intentionality. My name is Makita, she, her, hers, and I'm here for the future. Um, hi, I'm Ling, um, she, her, hers. I'm here because I'm furious. Furious? Furious. Hi, I'm Grant, male pronouns, and I'm here for a hopeful future. I'm Elvis, he, his, and I'm here for encouragement. I'm Raina, female pronouns, and I'm here because I'm confused. I'm Ruben, male pronouns, and I'm here for equal opportunity. I'm Angela, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I have a vision. Hi, I'm Jocelyn, and I'm here because I'm motivated, and she, hers. Hi, I'm Sardor, uh, male pronouns, provide equal opportunities for all. I am Sophia, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here to find hope. Hi, I'm Tony King, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm here to find my tribes so that we can get to work. My name's TJ. Uh, I go by him, uh, his, and I'm here because I'm interested. My name is Ivana, and I go by she, and I'm here because I have too many ideas. My name is Rita. Um, I use female pronouns, and I'm here because I think our democracy is broken and under threat, and I want to make it better. Hi, my name is Emma. I go by she, her, hers, and I'm here for justice. Hi, my name is Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm here because I'm curious and motivated. Hi, my name is Adriana. Um, oh, uh, I go by female pronouns, and I'm here to listen and try to understand. Hi, I'm Moin, um, uh, male pronouns, and I'm here for change. Hi, my name is Julia, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs, and I'm here to listen to the lived experiences around me. Hi, I'm Jack, um, male pronouns, and I'm here to learn from others. I'm Johnny, male pronouns, and I'm here just to be because I'm curious. I'm Dana, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I'm an idealist. Um, I'm Ivy, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I'm kind of angsty and frustrated and <laughs> want to channel that. 
I'm Nathi, she, her, hers. I'm here because there's a lot of people who aren't here. I'm Zoe, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I want to make a difference. Hi, I'm Ming and uh, Mel Pronouns. I'm here to like, learn and explore. Hi, I'm Maya, she, her, hers, and I'm here because I want to make a change. Hi, I'm Ellen, she, her, hers, and I'm here to learn how to have a conversation. Hi, I'm Carol, female pronouns, and I'm here because I'm worried but committed. Hmm. So I wrote all these down, and um, you know, it's kind of cool to see the balance here of how many people are, you know, of how people are feeling, and a lot of it, um, this is a mess and we'll rewrite it, because you might want to be reminded of some of these things. I think it's, it's, it's awesome to, to know why everybody's here. Um, and these are important things. Like, this is like, this is really, the, this is just like who we are. This is like, this is just human. It's the beautiful part of why we're here is to learn from each other, to, 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 to express what we need to express. It's interesting, there's people who need to take up more space and there's people who feel they need to take up less space. Inspired, I mean, there's a lot of, that's, there's cool stuff on there. Um, really cool stuff on that list. And, uh, and in, that, in this circle, that's one of the things that we were gonna do, right? And if you wanna, we can start with, um, Carol's gonna kind of bring us into, like, what have you done? Um, what, 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 what has you, what's got you here? And she's gonna have people sort of stand up so we can get an idea of what people are, um, are, Let's actually put that up for just a second because one of the things was, should we, when we can go into that, either looking at what our passion is for the issue before we figure out sort of what we've done, or do you want to do that for? Yeah, so let's do that. So Carol's going to sort of get us standing and we're going to stand up and sit down. have been so far. Uh, don't be embarrassed if you haven't done some of these things because you're college students. You've got other things going on. Um, but stand up if you're registered to vote. Woo! Woo! Wow! Stand up if you vote. You can sit down. Stand up if you've voted, if you've actually voted before. Good. If anybody needs to, to register, we can tell you how later on. <laughs> Stand up if you regularly follow the news. Good. Tell me, uh, just to throw out a couple of, how do you stay informed? TV, magazines, newspaper, radio? Just throw it out. NPR. NPR? Online? Twitter? Anybody read a newspaper anymore? Online. Okay, sit down. Stand up if you talk with your friends at least once a week about critical, political, and social issues. Good for you. Okay. Stand up if you volunteered for a community organization. Tell me, throw out some things I'd like to hear. Special Olympics? I didn't hear. Oh, good. I'd like to talk. What else? Humane Society. Oh, Humane Society? Ohio River? Okay, good. What, what is that? Oh, okay. Wonderful. Okay, um, stand up if you can name at least one of your two U.S. Senators from your state where you live. Okay. Who are your, who are your, who's your senator? Name one, please. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. You think. Okay, who's your representative? Okay. And what state are you from? Okay. Anybody from Ohio can name their two U.S. senators? Okay, do one. Okay, shared ground, Democrat. Who's the other one? 
Yes. Great Republican. Ron Portman. Okay, you might want to work on that. Know who your U.S. Senators are, your representatives, because they're the ones who are shaping the policies. Um, Stand up if you contacted a public official about something you care about. Wow. Give me an example. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Uh, how about you over here? Tell me. Yeah, what have you contacted your representative or your public official about? Okay. Okay. Any, anything else? What are some of the other ways you've contacted? Okay, wonderful. Against fracking. And what's, where, who did you call her? Good. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. How about you? Wonderful. And how did you write a letter or call? What what did he say? Or she? Stand up if you support a particular political party. I won't ask you which one. Okay. Stand up if you worked on a political campaign. Who'd you work for? Okay. Good. Okay. How about you? I actually work for somebody in Minneapolis who wanted to work with the council. Okay. Okay, good. You want to tell me that? Good. Okay. Stand up if you participated in the Women's March in Washington. In Washington. Stand up if you participated in a women's march somewhere else. There was one in Columbus, another. Okay. Okay. Stand up if you did something after the women's march as a result of going and being inspired from the women's march. Did you follow up on? How about you, Maddie? What'd you do? Stand up if you've been engaged in the Granville community around some issue of concern. Anybody? Yeah, what, what did you get to do? Oh, at the New Beginnings. I work there too. <laughs> What did you do? Really? Wow. That's interesting. Okay. A um, couple more. Stand up if um, you've signed a petition around an issue of concern. Good. 
stand up if you see yourself running for office someday? Let's see. We need you. You're needed. Think about it. Don't push them. Don't you dare push them. <laughs> okay. uh, stand up if you consider yourself an activist, which means a person who is actively working on one or more issues of concern. So I'm back. I'm back, you guys. I gave her that. Um, I, did, I, I stepped in with that for a very specific reason, teasing her a little bit. Because in the last three years, so I stood up to take action in my community um, out of need. I stood up to take action in my community because my water was in jeopardy. And I didn't think I had a choice other than that. So it was like a reactionary um, place of need. And what that did for me was thrust me in, and I was in it, and it was like 18 hours a day sometimes, and it was hard, and it was, it was actually brutal, to be honest. It was five months of straight, brutal, constant activity, all volunteer. So by the time I was done, yes, we stopped the bottling plant, but I was broke, I was exhausted, my partner, he was ready to sling me up. He was like, where are you? Where, why am I not part of this conversation? But we stopped the plan. So there was like this success. But at the same time, I was wiped. And so at that, at that same time, I started to work with young people. And what I found was, and what they, what you guys taught me, was the importance of stepping into this work because uh, inspired with the tools of my what what my passions are, invigorating my passions because here we are. We know we need you to want to step up and take action. Like Carol said, like who's gonna run? Who sees themselves running for office one day? Right now, you might not, and that's okay because. In six months, you might surprise yourself. You might actually be ready. In 10 years, in five years, in three years, it's important not to sort of lock ourselves into, um, into like a specific kind of activation, but more to, uh, to open up our passion, to invigorate our passion, and to work with tools that we feel comfortable working with, right? So when I stepped into that work, I came in as the event coordinator. Because I was like, y'all can do your stuff over there with policy and all that stuff. I'm going to make a party, because that's what I know how to do. And so I made parties. I made, I, we screen tapped all over the community. I felt awesome, because I was waking people up. About three months later, I'm going, um, you guys missed something over there in your policy work. Maybe you should look at that. It was one of the first things that stopped the bottling plant. It was my little, hey, you guys. I was kind of like a kid watching them. Hey, why don't you look at that? But I came in doing what I felt like I knew I could do really well. So when, when, now when I come into these spaces, I never want to tell another person, get up. Do the work. We need you. It's your responsibility. It's your job. It's your future. Make this work for me. Make this work for your grandchildren. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. How come you don't want to run for office? What's wrong with you? Why don't you want to go and help the people on the corner? You know what? It's not going to make anybody feel empowered or want to do anything. But what if you can do something you really love and benefit the greater whole. And that's what we're going to play with now. And Cecile's going to kind of play, let's, let's look at some of those ideas, some of those things that drive us, that we love to do. Are you an actor? Are you a painter? Are you a designer? Do you like to research? Are you a thinker? Are you the guy that nothing flies past you? We need you. 
we might need you to just sit in the back of the room, watch everybody else do the work, and go, ahem, you forgot that thing. Like, there's something for everybody in this work, straight up. That's, that's right. Okay, so um, we want you guys to take a minute. So I, I started my career in education, and when I taught here, I taught about um, Howard Gardner's theories of multiple intelligence. And so everyone has a different um, skill or uh, something that they, a, a way that they feel like they learn best, right? So Rachel and I were working today, and I don't remember what we were doing, but I was like, I gotta see that, it's gotta be visual. I, I, just, I just gotta see those words, you know? You're talking to me, I'm not really hearing it. So what we're gonna do right now is you are all gonna get some of those index cards again, those really bright index cards. And um, as Rachel says, <clears throat> lots of pens on the table, yeah. Um, so we wanna know how do you want to be active but we want to know what lights you up. Again, Rachel turned to me in one of our meetings and she just looked straight at me and she said, what lights you up? And I was like, who, no, who says that to me? No one says that to me. They ask me like, what, what are you making me for lunch? Um, those are my three kids. I got three little kids and that's what, you know, help me pull on my pants, help me pee, you know, these kind of things. So, but we want to know what lights you up. Um, for example, my little guys do light me up. They're when they, their little blonde heads when they're singing and dancing. This morning, one of them woke me up playing ukulele and singing, and he is, he's good, you know, so he's on key, and so that lights me up. It also lights me up to hear stories and read stories. I just read Rachel Aviv's article today um, in last week's New Yorker, it's amazing. Um, A-V-I-V, -V, if you wanna read that. But what about you, right? Not just me, what about you? Are you an artist, a musician? Do you like to do research? Um, do you like to take photographs? Do you like to make movies? Are you a spreader of joy? Hee hee, we need them spreaders of joy, y'all. Do you throw a good party? Do you like to cook food? Are you one of those people who doesn't miss a beat? Do you have a big car and a clean license? Do you like to travel? Are you a good writer? Are you a strong speaker? Um, I'm gonna leave you guys just thinking, what lights you up? How do you want to be active? Write on the index card um, what you want to do and the kind of activism you're interested in. Kind of activism that that you're gonna that you might want to take. Who the hell knows? And seriously, about those passions, really. If you say I like to bake, like don't. Question, don't sit here and look at this card and think about voting necessarily. I'm not, we don't, I don't, we don't wanna know what activation you're gonna take. We wanna know what turns you on. Are you an actor? There's some dancers in this room, right? Right, so th if that's what really is your biggest passion, write it. Don't be afraid to think about what turns you on. Because, because we're gonna try to figure out ways to give you something to do on the greater whole based on what you love to do. What do you love to do? Do you love to sit around and watch TV? Watch, I will find something for you to do. If all you wanna do is sit around and play video games. Seriously. You might not like what I tell you you're gonna do. Yeah, not kidding. <laughs> but in other words, don't, don't try to attach that to an activation point. Separate what turns you on from what you think activism is. And you can talk amongst yourselves and you can chat and like it's all, let's try to make it fun, goofy. Get it. Because I'll tell you, you like to cook? Do you say you like to cook? Okay, so I have, I'm going to tell you a story while we're doing this. I'm going to tell you a story. A couple months, last year, I was asked to get arrested. It was what I call a privileged arrest. So in my community, um, if any, does anybody watch Orange is the New Black? Do you remember that first scene? Do you remember the scene when they escaped and they all were swimming in the lake? And then the next season opened up and the, and the old Chinese ladies leaning up against the thing and the girl comes up and she goes, 
why aren't you, what, there's something going on. And the old lady goes, yeah, there's probably some kind of chemicals in that lake that Crestwood dumped in there because they never put anything good next to a prison, right? So Crestwood is a company that was looking to, uh, to store millions of pounds, of gallons of fracked methane underneath Seneca Lake in abandoned salt mine caverns, okay? And the people in that community said no. To the tune of 680 people were arrested blockading that entry point. And it went on for a couple of years. And so that community called me and they said, hey, we need some local environmental leaders to come up and me and this guy, David Braun, who lives in California, who was part of the band, has done a lot of fracking work in this community. And another guy in our community went up there with a bunch of other people and we all got arrested about 25 or 30 of us. And you know, really, it was what I call a privileged arrest. The cops had done it so many times. But, but the point was press and to weigh on this facility, he thought it was a great idea. And man, can I tell you, when you get out of jail, when you get, you get in the paddy wagon, your, your wrists are kind of, they try to be gentle, but you've got these like twisty ties on your arms. You go in there, you sit in there, you go through central booking, and you get out, and man, I will tell you, you know what's awesome? Something you cooked. You bake some cookies, you, make, you bring a lasagna, and we all go decompress. Don't think you're not doing something to support the movement, right? So like on this card, and whatever you're thinking about, what lights you up could end up saving somebody else's day? So that's why we kind of wanted you to do that, because you never really know, oh wait, I could just cook something and that's awesome for people who spent the day in jail? Yeah, it's super awesome. It's really awesome. It's awesome if you're, you know, my friend says I have two kids. I don't know what to do. I can't help. I don't have time. I don't, I, I, I can't, I'm sorry. I said, dude, you're an artist. Line five's going in, right up in your neighborhood. You got a pipeline, going in. Call that activation group and offer them a banner. You can paint a banner for that group in the middle of the night when your kids are sleeping. That's supporting the movement. So that's part of what we're trying to, we want to empower you to do is to feel those things. And I'm telling you all y'all dancers, if I hear that you're going to be rolling up on the governor's office with a flash mob and you call me with enough notice, I might show up and actually learn whatever choreographed piece you're doing and join you. There's something for everybody. So, you want to write them down? You, want, do you, want, you guys want to popcorn some of the things that you like to do? Or, why don't you hold on to those cards for now? What do you, th what is activism to you? C does anybody want to popcorn that? And Rita, at least I didn't see you. Oh, you want to do the writing? No. Um, what is that, does anybody want to talk, what does activism mean to you? Listening. To me, baking cookies for the frontliners. Questioning. Uncompensated issue-driven labor. That is my freaking life story right now. And boy, is that exhausting, isn't it? Right? But what if you're like, yo, dude, I'm actually only rolling in when it's time to dance because that's all I have the energy for, man. Like, you know? And I, and I don't want to say that, that, you, that everyone should be sort of lazy and only choose that way because there's all kinds of other ways too, right? But like, sometimes it, it, it can be exhausting and burnout happens when we're working towards uncompensated, issue-driven labor. But that's what a lot of people see activism to be.
So let's change that narrative. Let's add to that narrative. And let's look for ways that we can be compensated for that, dri that, that drive, even if it's um, an energetic support from the community around us. It doesn't always have to be like financial gain, but what if it's like the people who are praying for you? Are there any people here who are spiritually activated in their own space and community? Maybe like churchgoers or Buddhists or... So, prayer. Let's put prayer on there. And I'm not talking about the kind of prayer when you whip your mala out when the ship is going down. I call that begging. I'm talking about the kind of prayer where you hold yourself in the place of, um, you know, when you're, when you're holding space, when your heart is open, when you're in a relaxed space, when you're in a meditative space, when you can see the vision that you're moving toward, that kind of prayer. That's a thing, and we need more people doing that. What else? Yeah, just throw it out there. You can talk. Storytelling, just call it out. Nobody needs to raise their hand. We're all in this together. We're teaching. We know Carol uh, voting, right? Civic engagement, that's activism, right? Community building. Community building. Rita, you got any ideas? Come on. say on that than I just said. So the, the rule about how you get people engaged in some kind of activist group or issue or movement is that they'll show up for the issue because they're concerned about fracking or reproductive rights. But if they stay, they stay for the community. They find the joy of being with others who share their passion and you enjoy the working together or just marching together, uh, just doing things together with others who share your passions. I'll just add to that to say inspiring friends. By being active, I have been surrounded most of my adult life by people I just admire and love. And that be is because we have shared things that we, we all care about. That's no small deal. It's not, and I would say that um in the last several years that I've been sort of stepping up, that's been one of, that has been the reason that I stay active. You know, yes, I care about fossil fuel infrastructure build out, but I also really care about my friends who live on, like, right next to the pipeline that is going 105 feet from the nuclear power plant right above New York City, 30 miles up stream from New York City. So I could say that I'm there because there's a danger, but I also show up because I love those people that I've come to know in supporting their community. Um, I, I love them, and I'm there not only because I care about their children and their homes, but I'm there because I like to hang out with them too. And you come to find this really beautiful um, communities that act, that often spring up around issues because you're working with people who give a shit. They care, excuse my language, they care about their community. That is cool people to hang out with. So it's not even just that it's a community, just any community. These are people who care. They are taking action in their community because they have compassion for those around them and they have compassion for the Earth Mother or for the, the, the community as a whole. And those are the people I definitely want to hang out with. Yeah, big time. So on those cards that you wrote down stuff, is there anything in there that you're seeing up there on that list that we just wrote up? 
What is it? Listening, prayer, storytelling, voting, being civically engaged, teaching each other. Um, would we put marching? I mean, people consider that activism. Do people really think that's an, a, a, a thing? You see what I think? I don't know. Actually, I love to march. It's awesome, you know. Marching is awesome. How many people? Let's raise our hands. Everybody doesn't have to get up. How many people were... Um, have marched in the last year, like be it the, so like everybody, most, a lot of, at least half the people here, it's kind of fun, right? Like there's some, there's like, there's an element of like amazing camaraderie that comes when you're en masse and you're working together toward showing the world that you're there. Taking up space, so, so. I have a question, I have a question for you. So is, is activism, is activism um, like, Public? Does it have to be you out there in public? No. no. Did Did everyone hear that? It might not have to take place in public, but it might have to produce change that is public. Maybe I'm not sure yet. I'm just trying it out. Yeah, I mean, this is just a genuine question. Yeah. No, and I think that's an important question, you know, because a lot of times um, activism doesn't show up right away in the public. And there's a lot of people right now, um, there's, a, there's, there's actually careers being built around environmental activism and, and, and social justice activism. And people are, you know, there's a lot of cult of personality activity going on. And... What people don't realize is how much is going on behind the scenes. How many people are um, doing that? Baking the cookies, um, working to uh, to motivate the um, to keep it all running, pushing paper, even. Um, people don't see how much is actually going on in these movements and the silent people and the people who don't have the the the, the energy or the capacity or the desire to stand up in the front and be the, the, the face of the movement. But that does not mean for a second that you are not doing something when you're putting your energy in to that work. And it's important to recognize your value, to recognize the importance of, of sweat equity and how much putting your energy in um, matters. And so I would say right now, I think we should all stand up and like, Shake around and like do the to let me Because this is It's like twelve midnight already. I'm ready to go to freaking bed. I'm tired. I was up at six this morning. Really know how to do those like shake it off extras. I mean, we could all do like everybody shake your left hand, then shake your right hand. So, what I want to do, so we've kind of played with this like, what is activism? Some people are leaving. If you're leaving for the long haul, bye. It was good to meet you. We hope you come back. We hope that's a pee break. So, here's the thing we've been talking. Since 6.30, it's an hour and a half. Why are you guys here? Like, what do you want from us? What do you want to do now? Would you like to um, pick our brains? Would you like to ask questions? Would you like to lead any of this conversation? Would you like to, um, what's going on for you? As we were looking at this, why, what, what is sort of a more concrete reason for why you might want to be here? Because the, those of us who are putting this together, we went back and forth a lot, trying to go, well, what should we get them to do this? Should we, do you guys want to break out into groups you want to take? Make active, active, yeah, give her a mic. Um, do you want to do stuff? Um, mine was like this kind of more surface. More surface. Um, I was wondering, like, since you're an activist, like what you do on a daily basis. Daily basis. <laughs> so, so, um, so, let, and let's, we can work around that too, right? What do you do on a daily basis? Personally, 
I have like several different roles in that work. So right now I'm not working for an organization, but when I'm working in an organized fashion, I will be doing anything from um, supporting the team that I'm working on. Like if I'm working, when I was working with Earth Guardians, I was basically running the organization. So I was doing everything from making memes that, <laughs> that like tell about our young activists you know, I was like raising the voices of young youth leaders. I was, um, I was building community, I was building uh, partnerships between organizations. Um, sometimes I was literally just posting information on Twitter and Facebook and posting like articles that people need to hear and read about and know what's going on. Um, scoping projects. So when uh, for instance, when a pipeline's coming into your town, it starts out with like either they're halfway through and then you find out, or they, <laughs> they, they start with a proposal. And if you're paying attention to what's happening in your um, local government and your community, you will know that a proposal has gone in and then suddenly you're scoping an environmental quality review. What the hell is that? Well, I didn't know until I'm sitting there with a piece of paper going, these people want to go right through this wetland. And then they're going to build a 540,000 square foot, what? And so it could be any, like when you're in deep in that kind of work, you could be doing that. You could be fo research and, de and, and development. You could be doing fundraising for your organization. You could be baking cookies. For me, it was all of that. It still is. And I'm not, as well, I am kind of like an auntie to a lot of young people. So sometimes it's answering the phone at 2 o'clock in the morning when one of the kids on the res wants to kill themselves. Because it sucks living on the res when you don't have an opportunity for a job, you don't have an opportunity to go to school, you don't know if you're going to eat, your mother wants to give her kidney to her husband because he has 800 count blood sugar and he needs a new kidney and you're a match but now you can't give it to him because the T word just took all of the funding out of the hospitals in native country. So it could be any one of those things. And when you step up to be active in, within a community like this, it, in this kind of work, it could be any one of those things, none of those things, all of them. What do you do? Yeah. Chris, who's got the mic? Well, I would just echo some of the things you said. I, I examined the responses that you all made about you know, what you like to do. And I was struck by the fact that not many of you like to do the ones that were phrased as what? Sweat equity and uh, what, I can't remember how they're phrased. Mundane work or you know, mindless tasks. Mindless tasks. Oh, unpaid. What was that? That was so good. What did you say that word? That's what he was on. But you know, I think there's there's so much work like that to be done. And the march is what everybody focuses on or the, you know, something out in public and people making speeches and so forth. There's so much that has to be, get done before that can happen. You might have to put up posters. You might have to put labels on envelopes. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff just mundane sweat work that has to be done. And the thing is that you can learn to take joy in that. You can learn to go home at the end of the day and you think, okay, you know, I, I've done a little bit today. I've made a little step forward and feel good about that. And usually you're doing it with other people and you have a good time and you go out to eat lunch together. And so there's some community building in the middle of it. It's not just all drudge work, but it is really so important. And anybody who gets work done in the world has to do work like that. Carol, what you got? What you hope to know? I love solving problems. I love seeing the problem I can fix it. If I can just get a few people together, I really, and I've had, you know, and it works. Bring people, it starts with the conversation. Uh, most of my friends kind of, you know, I, their eyes glaze over when I start to talk about fracking or something, but um, I'm amazed if, if I can learn to say it right. I bring people together, we talk about it, and we figure out what to do. 
And so her question is, what do you do? What are we doing every day? Like, what is the, what is the sort of like, what does it look like? Well, it looks like calling people, talking to them, having conversations, meeting for coffee, connecting people. Um, so it's a lot of people work, actually. And I like to add the element of fun. I really do. The things that I do, what brings people together is talking, conversations, meeting people, talking to your public officials. And if you do it respectfully and they, you know what you're talking about, you get their attention. And I work in the system, although I've started demonstrating and marching, which has been hard for me, but that's, I've learned that's fun too. I carry big signs about uh, in the environment and um, carpool and pick people up and take them to the demonstration with me. We go out for dinner afterwards. It's, it's, um, but I'm spending a lot of time doing those things now that I'm retired and I can. So uh, being active puts you in touch with the real world. And that's, that's exciting. Um, what's something that you feel like Denison could do better overall to like support um, like hey. your needs or your activist needs? Just like what's something that you feel like Denison is lacking? Um, just so you guys know, there are mics on every table. So just the, grab them off the table too, right behind you, just so you know. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear more about like transportation places. I think that if there was like a van or something that we could get, um, and like a, someone with a defensive driver or whatever, or someone with their own car, and a way to organize people. I think the interest is there to go places, but like me, I don't have a car or like access to any sort of public transportation here. So I think that that would solve a lot of things, because I do think that there is motivation to go, but there's just no means, realistic means to get there. No, it's yes, it is. Um, I don't really know to the full extent of what the administrative side of this is, but I think at least for me, I always have a lot of trouble with how much I have to prove that I need funding for something, um, which I understand that you obviously have to prove it, but it's to the extent that we have to go through in order to say like, this is something that we need. It's necessary that we have this amount of money to do what we want to do in terms of activism is frustrating a lot of the time. So I know that money is not unlimited, but oftentimes I feel like sometimes here it is a little more unlimited than they let us know. Could I speak to that issue of transportation? You know, if uh, you look at your responses on there and the question was, do you want, what level do you want to work on campus? local, national, whatever. Most of you want to work on campus, which is fine. I mean, you can do activism anywhere. In fact, you have to do it wherever you are. So you just look around. What the heck needs to be done? What are the things I care about, and how can I do something about them right here? How can I find others who share my interest in doing something right here? Start a new group, uh, you know, who whatever your task is. You're contacting representatives or you're planning something where there's enough of you, you can pitch in and somebody can rent a van and you can go somewhere if that's what it is. But a lot of what you can do is just, you know, work on campus, educate people, and uh, make things happen where you are. Uh, hi, I'm Ling. Uh, to answer that question, this is not originally my point, but uh, it has been uh, resonated in a lot of student group. Is that Denison student has just so much shit to have to do. Like I have, I'm a humanities um, major, and like I have 
100 pages to read each night. And it's just, it's just crazy. Like, like you have, you have, you have course load, you have part-time jobs you have to do, you have other commitments. Uh, like, I know there is a lot of like, a, a lot of classes that have an activism uh, component to it. And then there's a lot of classes that have uh, curricular, uh, what is it, the CSL, what is it called again? Yeah, yeah, the service program. And like even those sometimes can be very problematic. Um, so yeah, it's just like the, the it's just like the, the reality of like students already the hardest demographic to mobilize. But then on top of that, it's just like Denison students just like so, has so much things that they have to do. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so on, on top of that, like, is there a, a way that student can be more active in building our own curriculum and our own syllabus toward a more uh, justice pedagogy? So yeah, that's the question. Mm. Um, something that Dennis can work on would be um, not taking up space. So I feel like if they want us to be active on campus, them also thinking about the space that they're holding and the space that they're taking for student orgs at least right now, if we're talking about activism here on campus. So I think that's something that they could work on. Um, I understand that they're trying to build um, a relationship with students, but what are the, what, like how are they doing that? So I feel like that's another thing to think about. Can you clarify that just a tiny bit more for me, writing this down? Yes. Um, so uh, there's, there was a space up in the fourth floor Slater, the Center for Women and Gender Action. And um, so Pre um, Vice President Kennedy moved her office upstairs to the fourth floor, took that space off, and they're going to rebuild it. So we have a, a place for all minority students in one location. However, um, the place that she's taking, I'm not sure where it's gonna, who's going to take that space that she used to have. and. Um, um, so my thing is that we don't have places for students like in Outlook. So I think we saw a message that said that like, I hope I'm quoting this right. It said that um, why is administration taking up space when queer, stu queer students only have a closet? So I thought that was very powerful. I, I mean, I'm still remembering it. So I feel that's something that we need to think about. How can like we even like move forward Students, why are students not able to make more of decisions on campus based on curriculum and wanting to be more active? And I'm not going to say what you already said because you said it. And then, and then physical space. And that sounds huge to me because so I'm like, because so here I am going, we all wrote the, down these things. And like, for instance, I'm seeing, I'm not going to say whose card it is. I got it from around here. Baking, public speaking, when passionate, organizing, planning, and supporting others. Okay, so this is one of the cards that somebody put together. And from what we're just hearing right now, we haven't even begun to say, we're going to break out into groups, and now we're going to take action and figure out what we can do. But just sitting here listening to this right now, you just pointed that out, what they're pointing out. And I think, like, one of the ways that you can, A, make more time for yourself, B, understand and start to learn a little bit more about, like, the civic engagement concept, not that I'm not, I'm not saying anything, but it isn't already happening, right? But when you start to take action right here on campus in your school to make sure that you're getting what you need, that's the beginning of national campaigning. That's the beginning of national activation. Right here, world peace begins at home. How do you take control in your own space. And somewhere, and I don't know if we had printed it out, but we were talking about the Denison mission, right? And so when we, there's things that are, that you don't even always, but this isn't a, a, a state school, but in, in New York, when the bottling company came to our town, one of the things they were coming in on was a grant a tax abatement grant at Startup New York where the, the company came in, ushered by the school, and the kids were going to have this awesome opportunity to work in the bottling plant. 
kids were like, what are you kidding? We don't want to do that. And so they stood up. And one of the things they did was they took the mission of the school and they held their president accountable. And the, one of the top things on that mission was transparency for students. And the students are going, if this is a transparent governance, then how come we're not finding out until way later that you're trying to broker our time, energy, resources to a company that we don't agree with? And so the second that you start taking, um, at, you know, you start looking and paying attention to how your school runs itself, you might find they're breaking their own rules to make it hard for you. And in that way, you might find that you might start meeting people across all kinds of, and I'm not here to try to tell everybody to take down the school. That's not what I'm trying to do. Okay? But what I am saying is, there's a lot of things that you might learn in the outer world when you start paying attention to how the governance in your own school runs. And when you start paying attention to how the governance in your... I just wanted her to hold the mic. Just gonna... so, so here's my question. So, for example, if I'm hearing that we need transportation or maybe better communication about coordinating people who want to go to the same kinds of things, if we need funding, there's no shortage of money. Don't be fooled. There's no shortage of money. So it's not about is there funding, it's like how can we get our hands on the funding, right? If we want space, there is space, how can we get our hands on that space? Maybe an activism idea is about how do those of you in this room gather together with others who want transportation, money, and space, and create an activism around that, taking that space or finding the space that you want. Getting that money or finding the, where that money is and how you get your hands on it. Offering transportation or sharing with each other, maybe I wrote on here, finding a, a place where communication about transportation, about needs at that level can be met. So I'm really interested in connecting these dots between, as an introvert, love to bake, happy to be the supportive, want to believe that that is part of an activism agenda, you know? Those are the kinds of things I can do. Like, I've never had a problem finding money, I just want to tell you that, never. There is always money. The problem is, the challenge is, who has it, and how can I get it to where I think it ought to be? That's it, that's it, that's the issue, right? So I'm just putting out there that, you know, some of the people that are sympathetic to the three needs that I just heard here and others that we have heard and will hear, maybe we should like meet together and say, how can we strategize to get that going right here on campus right now? And so we're about, we are kind of getting into, we're here until 9.30 and it's 8.13. And when we were breaking this, when we were looking at um, sort of designing or trying to figure this out, like one of the biggest things for me personally was kind of finding out what you guys wanted and what you needed and what you wanted from this um, this circle up. And so maybe we just take a couple minutes to just even think about it or to talk about what you want from this. You have another hour and 15 minutes or whatever to, um, to utilize whatever, us if we're here, if that matters, um, or to just utilize the fact that you're here and you're looking across the space at other people who seem to want to um, take some action. How, what do you want, what would you like to do from here? What do you want to do? Do you want to break up into groups and sort of find out you know, who, who in this room is thinking about what and move together? Or do you want to just get the hell out of here? Or do you want to um, leave with some, some, some action that you're going to take? Um, how, how are you all feeling? And popcorn it. Forget raising your hand. Just talk. I like the idea of breaking up into groups because like, one of the things I, um, I heard was like a space for like Outlook. And I'd be really interested in working more with that and the students are interested in, in getting that. I think something that could be productive is sharing the resources and knowledge that we all have available in order to do that because I think that each of us 
coming to a particular position on campus and coming together and saying, I have a connection with this person, I have a connection with this person, let's put them together, can be very useful. Hello, hello. Uh, sorry, uh, can I speak? Coolio. Yeah. Um, I'm struggling with the idea of, um, we talked about it in education class, this paradox of education, well not education, schools teach us that you want to be the best, you want to be uh, competitive, you, you need to be selfish to be successful, basically. And what I'm struggling with is, yes, I do want to, I want to help out, I want, I want to do activist work, but I want to be successful first, if that makes sense. I want to be, I want to be selfish for once. Uh, I, I don't want to keep being taken advantage of, uh, of people who get to be successful because, because I, I don't know, lack of conscience or, uh, I don't know, lack of heart. I, I want to be that person who's successful who also has a good heart, but I'm struggling with the idea that if you wait, the worst can happen. But you have to wait to be successful. And so that's what I'm struggling with. I don't know how else to say it. And there's also sort of positive part of success, right? That's true, too. Because not hearing you. I'm hearing you say that, like, you know, sort of the, the Western, Western yeah. society says if you're going to be successful and you need to step on some heads to get there or you need to be in a competitive place to get there and you need to be willing to climb whatever ladder to get to there, but what is there and what does that success mean? And it sounds to me like what success means to you is um, care, take self-care, taking care of yourself, honoring your value, and also doing, um, doing good with your time and your energy, and so how do you blend those two? And how, how do you, um, and I think a lot of that comes into a place of sort of honoring and recognizing that that sounds like success to a lot of us. And I, I, I personally would be considered to be not, maybe not successful at 48 years old um, because I don't have a 401k, that's really, and I haven't, fact, you know, all of those things. But actually, I, I feel really happy in my life, and I feel really, um, I feel like I have done good things in my life. And so, how do you not sacrifice yourself and your self, you know, your nurture place and, and, do, and what's good for you, and still advance? And I don't think you necessarily have to wait to be quote unquote active. I think it's just a matter of sort of allowing yourself to feel okay about having a huge heart while you do what you need to do to grow. Um, I was going to say basically what you just ended on that, like, something that's been on my mind, like, throughout this entire process and hearing about how, like, you know, students are overwhelmed, there's a lot to do, like, we have, like, all these things we need to do just in order to like get through like an academic institution. Um, that there's lots of different issues that we all want to focus on, and that my like what I think about when I think about all of that is like how do we make sure that people are staying, you know, mentally healthy? Like how do we keep emotional health like a priority? Because I see a lot of people sometimes who exhaust themselves, you know, trying to constantly do everything all the time because they feel like if they let let one thing slip that they're either not good enough to be the kind of activist that everyone expects them to be, that they've been in the past, or that, you know, they have to be doing all those things at once. Um, and I feel like a lot of activism should involve more of, like, how do you take care of your community in that respect, knowing that they're, like, aligned and allied alongside of you, and so that sometimes people need to, like, learn how to incorporate that kind of health taking, health focus, etc. So, I believe that people exhaust themselves because um, I see familiar faces of these conversations that happen constantly on this campus and we do split up into smaller groups and we talk about the issues that are at hand but it's like the lack of actual initiative to do something and it's mainly because when we try to think of something it goes back to administration and back to that point where one thing that Denison lacks is it um, it doesn't have transparency and uh, accountability for the administration because we were at a town hall meeting where 
we were talking about these issues, but yet they kept avoiding the questions that were being brought up by students and the staff weren't speaking. And that's where it got tiring because we were in a room with the people who had the power, but yet we were still not being listened to. Um, so my initial question is, how do we get the people who have the information to speak to actually get it out of them when they don't want us to have it? And because at this point, no matter what, well, not that no matter what we do, but if we start something, if we make a proposal and bring it up to administration, like it's already, we can assume they're gonna shut us down because they've already done so many times before on this campus. So that's kind of it. My question to you, how can we get someone to speak who doesn't want us to have that information? Is that there is um, one, two, there's two staff members right now in this room. And I think um, coming to a place where you have like three, there's three. Oh, and Robin's here. Oh, Robin's, right, there's four faculty, right? Um, but, but the thing is, is finding those allies, right? And, and one of the things that I had, that we're gonna give you when you leave, which is just really, I can't even say that it's like super succinct. It was like a firing off of things that I wanted to sort of offer um, to you. So when you leave, you'll have that. And one of the things on there is, um, is uh, this sheet, which we had sort of, which had kind of, um, we're hope, I wish it was bigger, but on one side you sort of have the like, um, you're, you're leading, you know, your opponents, your active opponents, your passive opponents, your allies, your neutral allies, like this, just to sort of look at, and, and it's really just a framework to go, who are the people who are actually gonna step up and support us in taking action? Who are the people that are working actively against us, it, you know, against us, or against the, you know, so we could say like, the global office, so active opponent, do you know what I mean? To like happiness and joy, right? So this, you you can take, take that and, and you know, we'll pass this out, but you know, these things are sort of questions that are gonna be important for you as you connect more on these issues because it, because what you're calling out is really important. And the fact that you're looking at it at school, I think is super important because it's the same conversation really when you go out into your general municipality and then you go out into like the bigger picture and just your willingness to say that here with some faculty member and members in the space, like that's, that's big that you're asking those questions. And I think that the people here who are looking to start to take some action here on campus, I think that the more you hold each other and the more you get into places where you can really express with each other what's happening and form and build a little some community that helps you to feel like you have you're not alone standing there going why is no one listening to us i think that's super important and identifying who those allies are and who are the accomplices who are the people that are going to go all the way not just the allies who are like you guys are awesome the people who are like I'm going down with you, dude. We're gonna take this all the way. We're gonna hold them accountable because yes, the LGBT community needs a freaking space that's not a crappy closet with like that's cold and there's you know we don't we, there's nothing in there. We don't have anything like that. Stand for that. Hold that space. And there are people saying there's space here. How do you get it? It's about starting to find out who those allies are and who those people that are gonna support you are on the staff too, because that's gonna help a lot. And who are the people who are willing to take action, who are willing to actually hold some staying power, who are willing to protect themselves, who are willing to say, I have to say no right now because this is a little too much for me, but I'm gonna stick with you, I just need a break right now. Or, do you know, who are these people that, that you're gonna be able to say, we, we're gonna go, we're gonna take this, and I, can, I need to trust and accountability from you that we're not just talking some talk, right? And I think that's huge and it's very important to find those people and to hold them to that. That's something that I think, you know, we only have a few minutes really here left, but is there something that's brewing here amongst those who are here who want to say, let's put some energy towards something? Like, are there people here who want to think about actually looking in that way? 
Yes? Does anybody want to raise their hand so we have an idea of who those people are, so you guys can see who those people are? Right? And so there's like five or six people here that might, and I would say that's a to look into sitting down together and seeing if you have some commonalities around that, this subject. Because when you walk out of here, only a few people in comparison to the entire room of the 60 that we started with are actually raising their hand right now to say, I'm willing to go in for a long haul to actually take some action, whatever that means. And it might mean supporting those people who are going to be out in the front and being there. You know, when we took on that bottling here, and I know I keep going back to it because of, but it was such a huge learning curve for me because we had people who fully understood the policy, who went to town, who learned what all how all of the governance worked, and then there was the egg the farm citizens. And man, they were a pain in the ass. But they also made us look a lot bigger when we showed up at the office. So we don't need an angry mob of uninformed citizens. We'd actually rather have inform, you know, a large group of informed citizens. So we can't always say we have that. But who are the people who are going to say, I will be an active ally, or I'm going to be the passive ally. I'm going to be the guy who's going to sign the petition. I'm going to be the guy that's going to go all the way to town. Who are those people? You want to find out who those people are so that when you step into this work, you're not going, wow, how come I'm now the only guy standing here? Because I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked to step to the front, asked to leave the group, asked to go all the way to the office, to the front, and stand, and here we all are again. Where did everybody go? It's just me. And so it, it, it's hard to take action in that way when you're not sure that there's going to be people there liking you when you get through that hard um, first hurdle. You know? And so the, in, in this room right now, are there people who want to sit down and consider the idea of working together towards the end? Because, man, does it suck when, when, when you think you have to, and then you start to, and then you're left there kind of alone. And it's really, it can be really lonely activation. It can be really lonely. You can end up being like the guy who's out there doing it. And that's the truth. I never talk to young people and say, it's gonna be fun all the time. We gotta make it as fun as we can make it. As Carol said, like, we gotta make it fun if we can. But it's not always gonna be fun. Sometimes it's gonna be hard and gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. But that's what happens when you care about the community, when you care about what it is that you're doing. And again, your passion's gonna make So, I'm going to stay here and sit by and nobody wants to stay here, but I'm not going to take the time to go in and ask what it is. 832, we have an hour and 20 minutes. I just have, have a quick question. Um, how does feminism differ from activism? Um, because at the end of the day, I feel like we can assume that literature is at the uh, head of all these problems that we're having. Um, yeah. Do you know what I like to say? So, so when we were fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline, and I spent some time on the reservation, I was like, wait a minute. We got a pipeline to prison? We got a pipeline to the military industrial complex. We got a pipeline to missing and murdered women and indigenous girls. We got a pipeline to miseducation. There's not just a pipeline full of crude oil. There's a pipeline to prison in, in native country, right? So you start to go, wow, what are all these things? And then it all came back to, as you said, the patriarchy is kind of at the top of that. I call it the individuality industrial complex which is at the top of all of it. The part that says we're supposed to be separate from our heart, each other, spirit, the land, that is what's keeping everybody. So that separate, 
that thing that separates us all, that says that the environmental movement is any different from the women's movement, that is any different from the, from the LGBT movement, that's any different from the civil rights movement. I mean, it's all roots back up to this place of we have to, you know, it's time for us to figure out how to, to stay connected to our hearts, stay connected to each other, stay connected to the earth. So feminism, I can't answer that for you because I'm not a feminist. I'm a, I'm a woman trying to engage as many feminine principles as I possibly can in whatever work that I do. And so does that, does feminism differ from activism? I would say a lot of general activism concepts sort of are based in this kind of structured linear thing, but that's not, that's not necessarily how we have to approach it, right? But so what I would say is what are feminine principles that turn, that, that, that wake me up to feminine? What is a feminine principle to me is collaboration, right? Is working together, is me recognizing you for the value that you bring to the table and you and you, and they may be very different from each other, right? But but I can, if I, I can collaborate with you if I honor you for what you're bringing to the table. But if I say the only way this is going to work is if you cooperate with me, so do what I say and do it how I think we should do it, because I'm the one leading this, that's, not, that's, that's kind of like a more patriarchal style of taking action, right? So, so you can feminize anything. You can, you can bring collaboration and generation to anything. But if we're gonna smash the patriarchy, I think we might need to sort of like figure out how to do that in a gentle way that doesn't necessarily take us all down and exhaust us doing it. something that they feel is going to give them a piece of what they need, and then they'll stay. Right? Like it's getting late. And you can tell the group, right? There are some people have to leave, so there's no judgment here. But then they'll stay. And then you start to feel something kind of leaving everybody together. You know, you start to hear everybody's questions and everybody's ideas and thoughts and what we're struggling with personally. And then the energy goes deeper and then you stay. Like right at a time when we used to be getting tired, you can just feel something pulling us together, and then we stay, right? So I'm just sitting here, and I'm just staying. And I realized I was doing something that I do. I have a lot of different forms of spirituality that work for me. But I noticed I was sitting here, and I was feeling it happen, and I started rocking, right? I just started rocking. Because I could feel that you all have something that you want, and you're going to sustain it, right? And I can feel it getting more defined. And then when, uh, when Bill said um, money, was money, transportation, and there's three things that came up. Money, transportation, and space, right? Then I thought, oh my God. And so, and then, I mean, I don't even sound uh, intelligent when I'm just thinking in my head. So I'm thinking, oh, that's hot. <laughs> like, okay. I don't know why that, that language came. But what it made me feel is that then I started having flashbacks. Somebody said uh, storytelling was really important. And um, I thought, so this is what it felt like. Because here I am in black studies and women's studies. And here we are having a women's studies event. And we know students started women's studies, right? We know students started women's studies. So we said the administration wouldn't listen. I'm quite sure the administration did not run out of their office and say, I can't wait to sit down and plan a women's and gender studies program with you. I'm quite sure they were like not hearing it, right? And, and we're here and we're growing and we've we, we got fun, we got money. <laughs> and we, um, we can help events like this. 
So I'm, I'm thinking that for black studies, someone asked me something about how black studies got started. And I remember that uh, students wanted it so bad. Students started saying, well, if we don't have any classes and you can't start classes for us and our faculty for us this year, we'll do self-directed learning. We'll have college classes in our rooms. We'll have college classes in the BSU. And you know, the institution wouldn't necessarily be pleased to know that students were having to have a class in their room because the institution couldn't give you a class, right? So then a student and a faculty, because we didn't have any faculty trained to teach women's studies, so a student and a faculty taught the first class together. And there was so much interest, they had 77 students, which is not even a liberal arts model, right? A faculty member and a student taught the first class together, and they had 77 students. So when I hear what you're saying about um, we're interested in a space, I know, I'm sitting there thinking, I know students can do it, and it starts in a space like this where people are like, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I'm staying until they turn the lights out, right? I'm staying as long as I can. There might be something where you have to leave. But it's that feeling that we connected the dots. And whether you break the groups, whether you define the issue fully, I have a feeling that, uh, oh, I know Dr. Jackson in Black Studies who teaches social movement theory told me that the quickest way to have something happen is for students at the elite colleges to decide that it's going to happen, and the next thing you know, it's done. You don't have so much power in the midst of not being powerful in the hierarchy, and I think it starts just like this, and it feels very vague, and uh, we'll end up connecting the dots. And I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. I just need to reflect that back. <laughs> I, it occurred to me uh, hearing this uh, person beside me talking about the, the tension between wanting to be successful and wanting to do something to, you know, to be active. And the same theme was repeated somewhere over here where somebody was saying, Denison students have so much to do and there's just no, no time to, you know, to do your activism thing. Maybe that's something that, you know, a small group could sit and talk about. How do you balance that need to study, to work, to whatever, whatever it is that's, that you have to do, um, and also kind of meet the needs of your heart and your spirit and your feeling about what you want to do uh, by contributing to the world in some way. It's a tension that never goes away. I have news for you. It goes, once Denison is over, then you start having kids or whatever, or a job. My daughter worked in a law firm. She was just a, like a paralegal. But what she saw was these young men coming out of, I think it was University of Pennsylvania Law School, very high powered. They made like $180,000 their first year out of school, but they worked 80 hours a week. They had no life. You know, so it, you, dealing with this is something that you really do have to deal with. What is the balance I'm going to have in my life? How am I going to make room for, uh, you know, activism, family, other things uh, with this pressure that we all have to, quote, be successful? And I think the important thing to recognize is that <clears throat> this sort of balance that we're supposed to be getting from Denison, because it says it in our mission statement, um, actually is not supported institutionally um, and by implementation and by a bunch of other things. So this balance that we need, what's holding us from activism is intentional, right? So anyways, uh, once the camera goes off, people can come up and talk to me about uh, some stuff. Sounds good? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I just want to take a second and ride on um, Dr. King's story about the power in students. And I just want to tell a really short story about the dance department equally and how the dance depart department started. I was a sophomore at Denison. And we actually demanded a dance department and a dance major and space for the study of dance. This is in 
the 1970s, early 1970s. I know that seems like a million years ago, but I'll just tell you that we had a rotation where there were 14 of us sitting in the president's office all the time. It was a rotation. So if somebody had to leave to go do something, somebody else would come to take their space. Like we worked out, you know, you're talking about who does the baking, who does the mechanics. Somebody created the rotation. We all kind of just filtered in. We made sure there were 14 of us at a time in that space. And it took less than a year for the president to decide, okay, we'll have a dance department. That was so much easier than fighting us. And he thought, you know, it won't last that long, right? And we still have it here. So I just want to say, um, and in 2007, when we had, I know none of you were here, but when we had lots of events on campus and needed to pause in November and meet as an entire community, one of the comments that I heard from the students in my Women in the Arts class was, you have all the power, meaning the faculty. And I just want to say, are you kidding me? If every single faculty member showed up for something and only a fourth of the student body showed up, you would still outweigh us three to one. There are so many more of you than there are of us, just in terms of numbers, right? So there's a lot of power in the student body if you decide to work together. You do have allies, like Rachel was commenting. There are faculty who will help you navigate certain things, like how do I know who does this, or where does this decision get made, or that kind of thing. We can absolutely help do that, absolutely. So if there are burning needs, or even if there are needs that are just right now just barely simmering and they're going to boil up, you know, Really, it can happen. It can happen so fast. I was also here when the Women's and Gender Studies majors, well, when the first courses came in 1973, when the very first courses came, that course that Dr. King was talking about with the faculty and the student came together. And it was an our bodies, ourselves kind of um, course, right? We all had mirrors and, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, it happened right here, and it was because of student activism. It was all because of student activism, really many. I think that you're right that there's a, there's a lack of transparency. I think you're right that there is an intentionality about maintaining the status quo or moving in a direction that somebody else wants without great communication about, you know, what does the whole body of Denison want. I think that's right. But I also think one of the things we need to do about that is speak up, find each other work together, collaborate. So there are, there's a few of us here, there's four of us here who are quote unquote facilitating, even though I've been doing 99.9% .9 of the talking of within our facilitators. Does anybody want to break up into, I know there's, you said you wanted to break up. Do you want to, is there something specific you want, would like to, um, to address within um, a circle? Do we want to? Kind of look at like because you sounded like you're pretty clear on um, taking some leadership maybe in the community. Do we want to turn off these cameras? I think there's people who would like to have a little bit of space to not have the cameras on and maybe for the last hour. How do you feel about that? Yes. About taking the cameras off so people can feel a little more comfortable to be vulnerable.